can't tell you, I've been so excited about this one. I've been pushing for this, this interview for a long time, and I'm glad I got both of you because, uh, to me, this is kind of like revisiting the reason that I got into film in the first place. And let me tell you why. You guys seem to be on a similar page where you really took inspiration from one Mr. Kevin Williamson. Indeed. Absolutely. One of the better writers, I think, out there, one of the more prolific and has, has really done great. quite a lot of work. But a 17-year-old Michael Johnson got into film in the first place when he was watching Scream 2 and kind of picked up on, this is a pretty good movie. I like this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. To put it mildly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys clearly took inspiration, I think, not just from you know the, the original franchise, but Scream 2 specifically. And I want to talk about a tweet, first of all, James, that you had sent out where you had said there were little tidbits that you had to have in the movie that you both made conscious decisions to include things from the first two screen films. Can you guys talk about that a little? Yeah, I mean, I think I know what you're referring to, the, uh, the, the tweet you're referring to. But, you know, Guy and I, when we got the job the first, and we were enormous Scream fans and enormous Kevin Williamson fans, and we really, we sat down and watched all of them again together. And our, our sort of thing that we really wanted to do is we didn't want to sort of play this one counts, this one doesn't. Like we wanted to have something from all of the films in, 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 in our new one. And so that's why Marley Shelton, we brought her back. Like, so all of those sort of reasons. And then I think what you're referring to is uh, we have Dewey's theme um, from Scream 2 in the new one and which was enormously it's one of my favorite pieces of mu like film music who's that Dewey? Hey. <laughs> what are you doing here uh, <laughs> uh, i was worried about you it, it has a whole history to it that it was originally temp score on scream 2 because they made that movie so quickly it came out less than a year after the original. So they loved it so much that even though Marco Beltrami hadn't written it, they they paid the rights for it. And Hans Zimmer had written it. And they they put it in the movie and left it in the movie. And then Marco did a version of it for Scream 3, but it definitely felt different. And so we, I mean, we scripted that you, we were gonna use Dewey's theme in the movie. So it was a really important, and it was it sort of for Guy and I was like, it might just be important to us and nobody else, but that's what we, you know, it's like we want it in the movie. Yeah, it's really fun when people pick that up and appreciate it because it meant, it meant a lot to us, as Jamie said. And I think in terms of one and two, like we, we love all four of the movies, but one and two are the ones that had the biggest impact on us and got the perfect balance of scary and meta and fun and funny and, and great characters in a way where maybe three and four lean a little more into the meta and so it was important to us to kind of return to like, what's the, or at least, you know, in our version of like, what is the right balance? How do we keep the stakes high? How do we keep this scary? Um, it, Cause it is a, it's supposed to be a scary movie. Guy, it's interesting that you're talking about that, that um, balance between meta and scary, because one of the things I wanted to ask you both about is when you knew that you had the opportunity to write the fifth installment, you knew that meta was a major component. I mean, meta was a part of this franchise before they even had a word for it. Um, what was the, the process that you guys had knowing that you were in a sense going to go after toxic fandom? Well, that was a, that was a big puzzle piece for us. I think that what the first thing that we landed on in terms of the meta was as all of the screen movies have commented on what's going on in film what's going on specifically in horror we wanted to talk about the requel it seemed like that's what all the big franchises were doing not quite a remake not quite a sequel it's a bit of both we have legacy cast we have a new cast we have a passing of the baton and we felt that that was the right approach for the franchise just continuing forward but being a requel you had the opportunity to do what they always do which is comment on the thing that you're doing um, and so that was the first kind of meta piece and then it just kind of hit us like, what else do we want to talk about that's going to make this of the time? What's going to make this feel, you know, the why now and the reason for this movie to exist beyond just commenting once again on the state of horror movies or franchises or however you want to put it. 
And it was just this new phenomenon, you know, I mean, new ish, especially with Twitter, where it's just the, the toxic fans versus, you know, anyone who disagrees with them. And we felt very strongly about how unhealthy that is and how, you know, potentially scary it can be. You see the last Stab movie? Not really a fan of scary movies. That checks out. Anyway, it suck balls. Because nobody takes the true fans seriously. Not really. And it was not a, a very far throw to imagine fans taking it this far. And we're like, that's a very interesting motive for these people who care about these movies to such an unhealthy level that it's defined their identities and has motivated them to commit murders. And then the other stuff fitted very nicely around that. Like we had already decided that Sam was gonna be Billy's illegitimate daughter um, and things like that. But once we had those big pieces, it was like, okay, we have a framework, we have a why. Um, and it feels like it's worthy of uh, a screen movie. Again, a key decision. You're both coming off of the success of Ready or Not, which again, I loved. I got a great story about Ready or Not when, we're, when we've uh, finished Ooh. talking about this. Oh, cool. Can't wait but to hear the, it. The supernatural element in Scream 5 or Scream, depending on what you want to call it, of Billy being a part. I love the throwback. But just, it's not even necessarily supernatural, but just having him included and having him an integral part of Sam's personality, did you guys feel like this was a risk at any point? I think it's a risk that paid off personally, but did you feel like mm, we might lose some fans because it's been fairly grounded? You know, again, kind of what was the process that you went through? James, can you talk about that? Yeah, no, we, we knew it was sort of the big swing of the movie a little bit. We were very sort of excited about the idea and it's not supernatural. It's, it's you know, it's that, that it's her psyche kind of, it's the way it sort of manifests. And, you know, I think we all sort of have the little voice in the back of our head that sort of tells you you're not good enough or, you know, give in to your, you know, your darker side. So we, we got really excited about the idea of bringing Skeet back and having him do that um, and not just having it be, oh, it's the daughter of a, of a former character, but actually seeing that character in the film. That was really sort of exciting to us. And it felt very much like a, a cooler sort of show don't tell way to, to pull that off. And then, and Kevin, you know, Williamson, who, you know, was so kind to be the executive producer on the movie and shepherd the scripts and be with us sort of every step of the way, said, look, this is the thing that's the most not like the other Scream movies, which is, I think, why you have to try it. He was like, he was like, no, like, let's try and break new ground. Let's do stuff that hasn't been done before. So much of this is based in the other films and nostalgia. So like, let's take some swings. And to be honest, once we saw the first cut with, with Skeet in the movie, all of us went, oh, I think this really works. Like it was, you know, all the sort of talk of maybe we take it out if it does, just went right away because I think his performance uh, nails it. It's interesting. Sorry, I brought up Ready or Not, uh, which I'd love. I think that surprised a lot of people. Um, but, I, you know, just the team, I think the four of you, I will say, Matt and Tyler and you two. Uh, and Ben Valella, really... the, the executive producer, is also a member of Radio Silence, who's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, just tremendous work, I think. And like you said, um, perfect balance in horror between a little bit of nostalgia and trying something new. And you know what I mean? I just really love that. Um, the you. reason I brought up Ready or Not is the funny thing was you guys shot in Oshawa mm -hmm. at one point. Parkwood Estates there, the name escaped me for mm -hmm. a second. When you guys shot that movie, I was teaching high school English at the high school just across the street. Were you really? No yeah. way. Oh, that's, yeah. so cool. that's, that's awesome. And uh, I wanted to point out uh, my co-writer on that was uh, my longtime friend, Ryan Murphy. Uh, we grew up together in Nebraska and we were just, that was an original idea that he and I had had. It took many, many years to get off the ground. And when it did, it was, as you say, the perfect team, including Trip Vince and the other producer, like everybody and the studio searchlight, the execs we had, the marketing team, everybody was on the same page. And that, my God, the cast, we just got so lucky. So we were so happy with how it turned out. And uh, it was like, well, let's keep this particular group going. Uh, and Radio Silence was our only choice uh, in terms of directors. We really didn't have a backup. It was like, what happens if they say no? What are we going to do? And luckily they read the script and uh, really responded to it. And in our opinion, you know, knocked it out of the park a second time. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Glad you kept the team together and glad, you know, those Canadian actors that you had that oh, yeah. growing up, I've seen oh, in man. Canadian made sitcoms and drama. <laughs> just went fan um, it was, yeah, honestly, such a great surprise for us, great, uh, yeah. a lot of reasons. That's awesome. 
if we can go back to to Scream 2 again, because it, sure. it's just such an influence in my life, there's a great moment that I'm sure you guys have picked up on, and it's one of my greatest writing moments of all time. And that's when Dewey and Randy are talking about who could possibly be a suspect. And it's basically, well, what about Mickey? And Randy says, well, if Mickey's a suspect, so am I. Yeah. And Dewey just says, well, you are a suspect. If I'm a suspect, you're a suspect. Yeah. yeah. Right. Let's move on. You're right. <laughs> Let's move on. He's not a Nick and Knight rerun type of guy. He wants to break some new ground. Right? Right. So forget the boyfriend. He's tired. Who else do we got? There's Mickey, the freaky Tarantino film student. But if he's a suspect, so am I. So let's move on. Well, let's not move on. Maybe you are a suspect. Well, if I'm a suspect, you're a suspect. Do you have a point? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> just a brilliant little touch where he literally went, hey, this is the killer, but wait, we're going to talk about something else. And you don't yeah. even think about it until yeah. the end of the movie. Yeah. You guys did the same thing. Mm -hmm. You did the same thing with Richie where Dewey had brought up, you know, look at the love interest. And then right away it was like, well, let's mm -hmm. talk about something else. And then at the end of the movie, I go, of course it is. Of course it is. So He told us, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was that another kind of conscious decision? Was that something maybe you picked oh, yeah. up subconsciously from Kevin or just kind of got lucky in that sense that it No, not sub I think not subconscious at all. We you know, we had a lot of conversations with Kevin about the mystery piece, you know, and he also talked about a lot about Wes and how Wes sort of did it and Wes Craven's approach was I don't want to make everyone look innocent. I want to make everyone look guilty. So that when you get to the end of the movie you, and you reveal who it is, you go, oh, I, of course it's that person. Like, because of this, 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 and this. We come into these movies going, is it him? Is it not? Well, if the movie's telling me it's him, then it can't be him. But if the movie's not telling me it's him too much, it must be him. So playing with those expectations was a really big, fun part of all of this. And we loved the fact that, that Dewey called it out right from the jump. We thought, you, you know, you would be looking at the boyfriend anyways because of the Billy Loomis thing. And if you go back to the original movie too, the first thing they do is arrest Billy. <laughs> like, you know, it's like he, he and Stu are so, you want to go back and watch that movie, are so clearly the killers in every scene and all of their performances. And yet, and that's why it works. Like, so and it's yeah. still surprising. Yeah. yeah, it's that was a big influence as well. Just the, the billions too, just being so obvious from the start. And yet Kevin and Wes pulling it off as, as a surprise in the third act. You're like, well, oh, man, they told me and then I forgot. And they convinced yeah. me that it I, wasn't them. You know, hiding, just, hiding the killer in plain sight was was super, yeah. super important to us. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. It's a key to the franchise for sure. So because yeah. otherwise, like you said, it's just kind of like if it's who you expected the entire time, if you put no doubt into yeah. people's minds at all, mm -hmm. then what's the fun in that? I think that's great. <laughs> OK, another massive decision, the death of Dewey as well. We talked about how important his theme is and how important David is to this franchise. That moment where you went, it's necessary. Again, was it, uh, you know, you got the blessing from Kevin in terms yeah. of some of the other choices that you had made. When did this first cross your mind? Like, we have to take out one of the big three. It has to be now and it has to be Dewey. What, what, how did that come to be? It was, um, it was pretty early. It was definitely not something that we took lightly in any way. And it's interesting that we've been talking so much about Scream 2 because Randy's death in Scream 2, I think more than anything else, was the thing that Guy and I talked about with this, in that I remember seeing that movie and when Randy dies going, oh my God, no one's safe. I thought I was going into a movie where there were these characters who are the fresh new meat who are gonna get knocked off, and then these characters who are from the previous movies who are safe. And when Randy died, it completely upend, to me, it completely upends that movie in a fascinating and really interesting way and we felt that with three and four and the and the big three sort of surviving that we we really wanted and needed to be perfectly honest to do something similar um in this film and and Dewey is such a beloved character he's our favorite character so there is a screenwriting phrase you know you have to kind of kill your babies you know sometimes to make the whole thing work and that's I think what it was for us but yeah it was a a big decision that none of us took lightly Another story issue we were having was why would Sidney Prescott ever step foot in Woodsboro ever again? Because originally we talked about the uh, Dewey death, which we were pretty settled on pretty early. 
happening a little later in the movie, but we were like, no, it has to happen really right after the midpoint because something has to motivate Sydney to come back. And that's the only thing we could think of that would. Yeah. Um, and so everything, again, story-wise kind of clicked together and it was like, okay, this is going to be rough and a lot of people aren't going to like it, but you, you know, if everyone survives every time, it just, it becomes static and that's death for a franchise. People are just going to go, oh, it's another one of the same kind of thing. And it became necessary, you know, it was necessary to keep, keep this thing alive and keep the stakes high. And the, and the last thing I would say to you, I remember the conversation with Kevin and he did look at us and go, guys, it's a slasher movie. People like, die. People die. Yeah. Like it's a slasher. So the interesting uh, thing is, of course, with the internet and Twitter being what it is, all those theories that are out there for Scream 6 at this point, or Scream the sequel, we're not sure what it will <laughs> eventually be called. Um, I love, James, that you touched on the fact that you said nobody is safe. Can we count on that motto in the sequel? I mean, I think I think if I say that, then people will assume one thing. And if I don't say that, people will assume <laughs> something else. And so I'm not going to say anything. I think we have a, we, what I will say about the sequel is, is we love this franchise so much. And I hope that comes through in, in the film we've made. And that is carrying through into the film we're about to make. Um, and so, you know, we're just, we're looking to, we're looking to try and deliver another great movie in the franchise that we are all enormous fans of. That's a very diplomatic answer. That <laughs> <was right. laughs> That's what I'm here for. Yep. That's why I let him answer these questions. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to touch on, on two other films that are or films that you guys have been a part of in the past, which is, uh, James, you obviously wrote, um, Amazing Spider-Man. So as a fan... How mm -hmm. big was it to see Mr. Andrew Garfield back on that screen? So <laughs> it was, it was so awesome. I'm, a, you know, I'm just a huge fan. First of all, I'm a huge fan of Spider-Man, and which is, it's just why I was so excited to get to do this. And then I always thought the best thing in our films that we did was was to cast Andrew. I just think he's such a phenomenal actor, and he's so he loves that role so much. Um, and I think that comes through in his performance. And so to see him get to do that again just brought me, and, and to see people embrace him doing it, really just brought me a ton of joy. And, you know, the big moment that he has in the end of the movie sort of rounded off a story point that we set up, you know, eight, 10 years, just to sort of see that come to a close was wonderful. Cause it was something that we never got to do in his, um, we, you know, intend to do, never got to do in his, uh, in, in his sort of line of movies. So it's just, it was great. And it's a great, John Watts is a great director. I love Amy Pascal who produced the movie. I love all of the people involved with that franchise. So it was so wonderful to see um, that movie for me. You know, it, again, talk about my movie going experience. It's funny. I'm a six foot two, nearly 300 pound dude. And when I saw the moment where he saved MJ and how he kind of teared up, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how close I was to cry oh, simply because, yeah, it's just a, a beautiful moment in cinema once again. Mm -hmm. um, and Guy, I want to talk to you once again, another franchise that I grew up with. Um, Final Destination. So you, yeah, this is exciting as well. Another requel possibly, but there's some freedom that you have obviously with a film like Ready or Not, right? Where it's kind of smaller budget, maybe not as much pressure from studios. Then you jump into Scream, lots of pressure. You got to make, you know, very specific decisions and take a lot of factors. When you're creating something like Final Destination 6, mm -hmm. are you once again feeling a little bit of that pressure, you know, or were you just as a fan having fun with this? Oh, it's always pressure. It's, you know, it, it, because I take these th these jobs really seriously. And like, I love these franchises so much as a fan. I'm like, I do not want to be the guy to screw it up. So I put enormous pressure on myself. What makes me feel safe um, and, you know, capable of pulling it out um, is on Scream, it was Jamie. It was like, I knew the two of us were going to protect what's important about this franchise. And on Final Destination, I get to work with a good friend of mine, Lori Evans-Taylor, who's co-writing it with me. So yeah, it's a lot of pressure, but it's, I never let myself not have fun with it. It's like, if this is your opportunity to, you know, contribute to this franchise, to write an installment of one of your favorite franchises, you have to have a little fun. <laughs> you have to let yourself like really go, okay, well, what do I want to see as a fan? What haven't I seen before? But what, you know, you also want to protect the DNA of it. So it's like, you don't go too far afield. And I would not describe six as a requel, but that's all I can say about it. Uh, but I, yeah, I found myself nodding along when you said requel, and I'm like, I don't think that's actually technically right. So I'll keep you on your toes. 
Uh, but we're really excited about it. I think the script's getting in, uh, to a really good place and uh, hopefully there will be you know some forward movement and announcements on that soon. But I'm having a blast. Oh, very exciting. Well, okay, uh, this is my last question because I think this is all the time we have, but I got to ask, when you guys are writing these films, I now picture, especially with something like Final Destination 6, that you have like a notebook of creative kills. I, yeah, I've got my notebook of just like, you know, random horror ideas. And I think for, I, you know, I could probably speak for Jamie on this too. It's like, what haven't we seen? And it's just sort of a wish list. And it's like, if it makes sense for the story, let's pull it out. And, and we got a couple of those in five and we have uh, many of those in six stuff that we were, we were really excited to try. Yeah. That hasn't really been tried before, but makes sense in this new story world. So a lot of times necessity can be the mother of invention for stuff like that. And, and, and the other, the other kill in, in, in five that I always sort of think about is the, um, the hand sanitizer, the glass bottle of hand sanitizer gets smashed on, on Amber came from, I was at somebody's house a couple years earlier and they had a glass bottle of hand sanitizer in the kitchen. And I went, well, that's weird. And your writer brain goes, you know, I can set someone on fire in a movie with that at some point. You file it away. And even though it's like a nice afternoon with, you know, a bunch of other parents and your kids, you're thinking of setting, how can you set somebody on fire in a movie? And that's just the, the blessing and the curse of being a screenwriter, I guess. Amen. So the moral of this interview is if you are at a kid's birthday party with James, just, <laughs> you know, if you see his eyes kind of drift all of a sudden, you know exactly what he's thinking about. Exactly. That's right. That's, well, gentlemen, thank you so much. This was uh, a pleasure. And I could talk about this franchise in this movie, you know, at any point. Promise me one thing, please. If you do ever come back to Oshawa, uh, look up. I'm now a high school art teacher, but look up the high oh. school art teacher in the area. I would love to make a cameo in whatever project you guys are doing. But I can't wait to see your future work. And thank you so well, much for you. your time. An absolute pleasure. And and good on you for teaching and, and, and you know, and, and contributing to society other than uh, <laughs> minds like Guy and I do. So exactly. Thank you very much no, for it's, your service, sir. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for having us. Hey, Real Students, thanks for watching. If you want to subscribe to Real School, click that round Real School logo right beside me. Also, click that damn notification bell so you're aware of all of Real School's new content. You can follow me on Twitter, and of course, if you get anything out of Real School, you can always give a little back. Just click the link in the description below or the button down there, and you can become part of my Patreon team.